Caroline Farrow is a UK-based conservative Catholic who started a 2010 blog in response to what she claims was negative coverage of Catholicism. Since then, she's grown in popularity among bigots from many backgrounds due to her views on abortion and LGBT plus rights. Most recently, she's taken to constantly harassing trans folk, something that wanted her a visit from the police. Of course, as a response to this, paper after paper leapt on the case as evidence that the slippery slope they've all warned us about yet never had the evidence for has finally arrived. That poor Caroline Farrow had been caution for nothing more than simply speaking her mind, for misgendering a trans person, specifically the trans daughter of Mermaid's CEO, Susie Green. I, for one as a trans person, am rather shocked. I had no idea that we had just that much legal power. So what happened? Did Jordan Peterson's premonitions actually come true? Just in the UK rather than Canada? Well, upon an in-depth review of all available evidence, I'm happy to have the answer. She fucking lied in the so-called journalist of many UK papers, as well as our resident shitlords here on YouTube, ate it up without a second thought. She was not cautioned for misgendering, but rather interviewed for targeted harassment, including a series of libelous allegations. Now, misgendering did take place in said tweets, but if you've read them and claimed that was the issue, you're lying to yourself. I'd just like to take a moment to read said tweets, tweets which Farrow has since removed. Heavy on the content warning here, these were four tweets strung together in which Farrow stated, quote, Susie Green is in breach of Samaritan policy on how suicide should be discussed and broached in the media. What she did to her own son is illegal. She mutilated him by having him castrated and rendered sterile while still a child. Susie may feel that giving her son off-label illegal medication aged 11 and drastic surgery was the path of least harm in her circumstances, but she shouldn't project and impose on other vulnerable kids as best practice. But as Posey Parker found out, when you criticise Susie Green for castrating her 16-year-old son, she writes pages of Kant describing her journey and reporting you to the police for hurting her feelings. I think it's time everyone called out Susie Green and Mermaid's policy out for what it is. Child abuse. End quote. As you can see, the issue is less about misgendering and more about the act of libel and harassment. Farrow has not only made moral claims, but very specific legal ones on two accounts. Namely, what she did to her own son is illegal and off-label illegal medication. End quote. And this is what Susie Green had to say on the incident to the BBC. Every day, um, my daughter is misgendered online. People send me tweets, emails, etc. So this isn't something that, that's uncommon. What was uncommon about this, but this was a journalist who had a public platform who used that to send very deliberately malicious and nasty messages and it's not just the misgendering, it's actually the context that she puts it into and that she calls me a child abuser. Um, Mermaid stands for transgender children and young people. We stand for trans rights. We also say to people when they receive online communications that are malicious and nasty that they should report them as hate incidents. I didn't feel as um, the CEO of a charity that supports transgender children and young people that it was right that I didn't do the same when I was okay. subjected to that. I just want to be clear. Did you contact the police because Caroline Farrow had misgendered your daughter? No. Did you I... con... No. No. Did you contact no. the police because, amongst other tweets, I mean, we, we read them out there, she was accusing you of child abuse? Yeah, and also the stuff around mutilation, castration, and the fact that she constantly, I mean, she constantly refers to, to my daughter as a boy, um, but that's not the key issues in here, weren't those. It, it was the, um, the really damaging things that she said about me and my actions that made me decide that this was an appropriate course of action. And as I say, you know, we tell people to report hate incidents and hate crime online. These things are endemic. So for me not to do so in my position would have seemed to me to be a bit of a cop out. This and is what this is. We invited Caroline uh, Farrow onto the programme this morning. She declined. Uh, she said she couldn't talk to us because she'd promised an exclusive to a Sunday newspaper. She did tell us this. I got a call from Surrey Police on Monday night saying that I had misgendered Susie Green's daughter. I didn't do it with malicious intent. I was referring to her daughter as a son in the past tense before she had her gender, reassi gender reassigned. 
If you're yet to have your penis and testicles removed, then you are a boy. In any case, it was a Freudian slip. The CPS said I have to come in and do an interview under caution. Susie says she found my tweets spiteful and distressing, which wasn't the intention, but even if it was, should that be a crime? I don't know when the interview will take place. It's in the hands of the lawyers. Susie has since dropped the case, afraid of how the news continues to misbetray the issue. Now, don't get me wrong. Farrow's continued harassment of both Susie Green and her daughter, Jackie, are vile and certainly merit investigation under harassment. But the presence of active libel, the claim that someone has done a specific illegal act, completely ends debate as to the legality of said tweets. Those tweets were criminal, not that anyone cared. Okay, some people cared, namely the trans community, Pink News, and The Guardian. They cared, but no offence to them, that's a small drop in the ocean. This story has been shared to millions of people all over the globe. It's become just one more brick in the wall of anti-trans hysteria. Farrow even got herself a spot on Good Morning Britain, something I had to force myself to watch. Not because of Farrow, but because I know I'd have to listen to the smug little oinks of Piers Gammon Morgan, a man whose career consists of calling everyone else triggered snowflakes before then having a meltdown over a vegan sausage roll. Let's just get it over with then. And I guess there are two parts of this that I'd like to talk to you about. One is your reaction when the police banged on your door and you realised that something you tweeted had become a police investigation. So let's start with that. I mean, you must have been, I guess, staggered. Why should they be? The fact that Twitter is a relatively new platform in no way affects the existence of UK defamation and harassment laws. Just because it's online doesn't change the nature of what one publishes. UK papers have faced defamation charges in the past. That's how I know something about them. I had to study defamation during my piece on Sally Morgan, who famously sued the Daily Fail for libel. Sally Morgan is a person who claims to be psychic, yet has never demonstrated her powers, so a charlatan by all accounts. And do note, I am legally protected in saying that. What I wouldn't be legally protected in would be claiming specifics about how she goes about her work, like the Daily Fail did. They made very specific claims that she had used an earpiece to receive information via an accomplice. The very specific nature of this claim is what led to the Daily Fail losing the case, whilst I'm secure in saying that Sally Morgan is a charlatan since nowhere has she demonstrated to have the skill of which she claims. And said case shares a lot of commonalities with Farrow's very specific claim about Green's quote, illegal, end quote, actions. Then there's a whole harassment element. Misgendering someone is not a crime. Misgendering someone as part of active harassment designed to inflict pain, as with any form of harassment, is. Now, there's a big difference there, one which is completely ignored throughout most of the discussion on the topic. The way this is framed as woman faces jail time over a misgendering transgender person suggests that anyone anywhere who accidentally misgenders someone is at risk of being punished for that. The reality misgendering someone only becomes a problem as part of an active harassment campaign designed to belittle and intimidate the target, namely both Jackie and Susie Green, but I guess such news has no place in this discussion. Absolutely, um, because all I was ever told by the police was the, the first thing they said to me was, following an appearance with Susie Green on Good Morning Britain, you made a series, of, and, and the first thing I thought was, oh my goodness, I'm going to be interviewed over something I said on television, you know, for sort of six months later. They said, you made a series of tweets in which you misgendered uh, Susie Green's daughter. Mm. And uh, I was absolutely staggered for, for two reasons. Um, firstly, I have a tweet cleaner on my account, which automatically deletes tweets, I think, after every two weeks. It might be 10 days, but... So, um, Susie Green has said I deleted the tweets as though I was ashamed mm. of them. No, I wasn't. I just couldn't remember what they were. Uh, and secondly, I couldn't believe that I was going to be interviewed under caution for misgendering, which is not a crime. And at the same time, Surrey Police were very well aware I had been the subject of a horrendous uh, campaign of stalking and, and intimidation that went way above and okay. beyond anything I had okay. said, and they've done nothing. And that, yeah. that's for other stuff. Sure. So, yeah, no, so my reaction, I was terrified. I was shaking. I couldn't breathe. The room was spinning. I was, you, you know... How many I, children do you have? I have five children. So you, and you were presumably thinking the worst-case scenario is I might go to prison here and my kids won't have their mother because I have misgendered somebody. 
Yeah, ab absolutely. And I, I thought they're going to try and make a test case out of this one mm -hmm. because I know that there have been a number of other individuals who've had charges okay. brought against... So as we can see, Caroline Farrow is continuing with the active lie that the police were investigating her over misgendering Susie Green's daughter, something she's proudly displaying on her Twitter feed at the time of recording. This is even though the true nature of the tweets, both libel and harassment contained, are there for all to read. As for the tweet's removal, that's really irrelevant. Just because you remove something does not then spare the person targeted of the consequences of your actions. Tweets typically have a relatively short half-life, as with most media. An interesting fact to note here is also the fact that slander, the spoken counterpart to libel, also exists under defamation law. This is even though there's not always a way to play back what someone has said. So as we can see, timescale is irrelevant. Two weeks is more than enough for said messages to have an impact on the lives of both Susie and Jackie Green. I, and tw Twitter I, has now said they will ban people if they deliberately target transgender people and deliberately misgender them. Absolutely, and that's why I've been very careful. And, and the other thing I would say is I wasn't targeting Susie Green's child. Uh, and in fact, when we look at the tweets, which I know we're going to, I made those tweets 10 days after the original debate yeah. here. I didn't tag her in either. Okay. I wasn't tweeting at her. However, you I was did, tweeting yeah. about her. Yeah. So fucking what? Both Susie and Jackie Green are well-known figures in the public eye, at least within interested circles. You don't have to tag someone in for it to constitute as harassment. By posting said tweets to your audience whom you know constantly abuse Green and their daughter, making a series of libelous allegations in doing so, you can be certain that a portion of your toxic audience will act on it. Now I'm very used to seeing this playing naive tactic on YouTube, but as Farrow is claiming that she is also a victim of abuse, that sort of punches a hole in that story. If you want to claim the harm that you've actively caused someone else, you can't then pretend like your own actions were innocent. Now none of this even impacts on your actions in going after Susie and Jackie Green. You're just a bully wielding their platform to harm people you hate. There is also a but, that, and yeah. this is the but. Okay, so you believe that you are being investigated for misgendering, mm -hmm. so using the wrong gender in reference. Susie Green says the posts were malicious and not just misgendering. Um, and under the Miscommunications Act, the Malicious Communications Act, British Act of Parliament, makes it illegal to send or deliver letters or other articles for the purpose of causing distress or anxiety, and also applies to social media. In your tweets, you say about Susie Green, what she did to her own son, she mutilated him by having him castrated and rendered sterile while still a child. You say, castrating her 16-year-old son, she writes pages of Kant describing her journey and reporting you to the police for hurting her feelings. I think it's time everyone called out Susie Green and Mermaids, which is the charity she represents, for what it is, child abuse. I mean, you say you didn't at them, you know, you didn't actually tag them, but you've quite clearly targeted them. You have to remember, though, yes. And also called on other people to yes. do the same. I'm actually surprised that this was brought up on Good Morning Britain, and whilst I'm hesitant to assume that this is going to last, can we just acknowledge the fact that Caroline Farrow has just admitted to lying about the case mere seconds ago? Like, she just claimed that it wasn't harassment, it wasn't abuse, and now after being drilled on it, she's gone, yes, okay, it was harassment, it was abuse. I hadn't expected that. Like, can we just acknowledge the fact that even though I'm sure she's going to try and to go on to explain how said targeted harassment was perfectly acceptable, it's still worth noting the fact that Caroline Farrow just admitted that she'd lied about this on national television. How is this not being plastered everywhere? But I think you have to remember that this is political, not personal. So Susie Green... It's incredibly personal. But Susie Green... Using the terms child abuse yes, and castration. But Susie Green is a public figure who runs a lobby group which has access to Westminster, which influences local education authority policy, which influences the police. 
which influences, you know, public policy in this country. And that the problem is, Susanna, I completely understand. If Susie Green was a private individual who, you know, was a mother of a, of a trans child who'd done this, I would not have said a word. But the problem is Susie Green uses their child as advocacy for her lobby well, group's alternatively, position. Alternatively, Susie Green, who is at Mermaids, is part of that charity because of her own personal experience but, as the um, mother of a but, transgender but, child. But this is the point, but she uses those experiences to advocate for other children and she has made her child's journey public. So she has put her, her child, you know, she made she a could, whole she documentary could, about she this. Being a public figure does not then mean you have to accept defamation or harassment. See my previous Sally Morgan example on that. That this is your go-to excuse when your lie was caught out to suddenly turn 180 degrees and switching from it wasn't harassment to well, they should expect harassment as public figures is rather telling. You're desperate for any excuse and you're just jumping from one to another. And nowhere do you acknowledge that lie on your Twitter account. It's as if you're trying to ignore the facts that you got caught out lying. It's true, isn't it, that she couldn't have done uh, with her then son, now daughter, she couldn't have gone through with this legally in this country. That's right, and, and Thailand were sort of so nonplussed or outraged by what had happened. Thailand then changed the law to... Um, OK, so, so to it make... wasn't illegal in the place but, where it was done. But at the time... So to call it illegal is not true, well, because it, is... it happened under it, well, the it law was illegal, it, it in It was illegal country. in this country, and, you know, at the time, and it okay. was illegal. And the other you thing you haven't is... made clear in well, your you know, tweet... Well, you know, because... Because tweets are, you know, a very uh, limited uh, forum, and actually, well, as well, the to other, be fair, the other, you can write all sorts of things. The, the other and thing, if you want to explain, I think the problem is, and I know that the police have dropped this, but Cece Green obviously did experience distress and anxiety, and her child as well, as a result of of what happened, because otherwise she wouldn't have complained to the police in the first place. There is a way, isn't there, of talking about these issues. <laughs> without using inflammatory language. The, the, Even if someone is a public figure, the, we need to treat each other with okay. respect and dignity and compassion, the, No. I just love the way that Susanna Reid shut down both Morgan and Farrow on that point. I'd also like to note the fact that medical tourism isn't restricted to trans people. Consider the fact that in 2016, 3,265 women had to travel from the Republic of Ireland to the UK in order to have access to safe abortion services. Now, I get that this doesn't change things for Farrow, who is pro-birthing vat, pro-biological slavery, but it should highlight something for the ethically literate out there. Sometimes necessary medical procedures are blocked for inhuman reasons, forcing people to seek alternative routes. That's why you can't actually ban abortion access, you can only ban safe abortions. By the way, I should note the fact that Susie Green's daughter was 21 as of 2015, I feel that fact is being lost as we're discussing this in a sense of Green's daughter, Green's child, etc. So I just wanted to note that. They're an adult now, living a happy life in who they are. The help they received was a success and has improved their life significantly. Green's daughter was prescribed puberty blockers aged 13 and received confirmation surgery in Thailand at 16. That means this happened around 9-10 to 10 years ago. I know they were 18 when BBC3 released a documentary on them. A fact we'll return to shortly. What's interesting to note is that the minimum age to request gender confirmation surgery in the UK since at least 2012 has been 16, specifically in Scotland. Meanwhile, it's 17 in England and 18 in Wales. This is in line with the general rules of surgery in the UK. Oddly enough, the Republic of Ireland has its age of gender confirmation surgery set at 16. I feel the need to mention this as a response to Farrow's complaint that Thailand has since changed its laws. Well, so has the UK, and Green is well within what's now legal. And yes, I do support retroactively implementing the law. Of course there is a way of, of talking about things, but, you know, you can't go... I didn't say anything that is not in the public domain. You know, I didn't... I didn't sort of go and find anything out and, and put it out there. And, and the thing is... Nobody is talking about what you didn't do. Not a single person has raised breach of privacy as an issue. This is nothing more than a red herring. It's meant to vindicate yourself of the targeted harassment and defamation by pretending that it's about privacy when it isn't. The charge that Susie Green and the Mermaid's Charity are child abusers with very specific accusations of criminal activity have 
nothing to do with privacy, nor does your abuse of Susie's daughter. This is all just a distraction. Yes, there is respect and compassion and dignity, but actually one of the things that Susie Green did on a BBC documentary about her child's journey was to publicly talk about her child's genitals and how they had been shrunken by all the uh, cross-sex hormones and the puberty blockers, so there wasn't enough material to work with, making the procedure, you know, actually more, more dangerous and risky. And so the thing is, I was talking to my own daughter about this, and I said, how would you like it if I talked about your intimate areas on television? And she's seen laughing, so she okay, invaded her thing, child's Caroline, own Caroline, privacy Caroline, here's and dignity. A mother's entitled to talk about her child in any way she sees fit, right? First of all, I completely disagree with Paul Morgan here. When it comes to such personal matters, parents should seek prior consent to discuss them in public. And that seems to be what Susie Green did with her, at the time, 18-year-old daughter. So not a child, an adult. Note, both Jackie and Susie took part in the same BBC3 documentary. At least I assume Farrow is referring to the 2012 Transsexual Teen Beauty Queen documentary put out by the BBC. It does contain clips which align with her comments and it's the earliest documentary appearance I can find with either Jackie or Susie. So if we can just play the relevant segment, I apologise for the video quality. So the Greens flew to Thailand, where at the time it could be done legally at 16. They booked her in for her 16th birthday and I told her and she danced around the room for five minutes. It's like, oh, it, was... it was like a victory dance. It was like, yay, yay, I'm getting a fanny. <laughs> <laughs> don't really know the technical terms of what they did, and I really don't want to, it's gross. It's just like, oh, no. The majority of surgeons around the world do something called penile inversion, where they basically use the skin from the penis to create the vagina. And she hadn't developed through full puberty, so to not put too fine a point on it, there wasn't much there to work with. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jackie, she'll hate that. <laughs> From the minute I woke up, I felt different and everything just seemed so much brighter. I was who I should be and no one could tell me otherwise. She just went, oh, I'm so happy. And then she burst into tears and she went, I can't believe it, I've got a fanny. And just, we were both in tears because it, it wasn't just what she was saying, it was just the look on her face. She just, she was just so happy. It was the start of my life. And from there, it's been pretty wicked. For a normal working mum, it was a huge financial strain. Worked out between 28 and 30,000 pounds altogether. I put it on my mortgage. I had no other way of paying for it. Is she going to pay you back? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, the mood is very light, as Varro rightfully points out something assisted by both the recording crew guiding Susie and the music it's played to. This is a form of emotional release from the much heavier stuff that came before. And I'd just like to show you that juxtaposition to show you that the entire thing wasn't like this. Jackie clearly has an incredibly strong sense of identity, and she's had to fight to express her true self for her entire life. That battle became particularly fierce at secondary school. Despite arriving as a girl named Jackie, in her small hometown, she wasn't able to escape her past. Secondary school was an absolute picking nightmare. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she just was a girl and she just wanted to be treated like a girl, but it just made her a target for all this nastiness and, and bigotry and hatred. It was so obvious that I was a girl. I had long hair. I kind of guess I was pretty. So it was just like, why? I don't even look like a guy. If I had a beard and I had, like, you know, I taught, like, friggin' Barry White, then I would get it, but it's just like, why? Jackie was attacked a couple of times in the street by other kids. They circled her, about 20 of them, in the playground, shouting out, oh, you show us your dick, when are you gonna have it chopped off? There was one boy in, in school who kept calling her tranny, 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 freak, tranny, man beast, and it was every time he saw her. And the abuse wasn't confined to the schoolyard. When she was 14 and two adult guys attacked her, they were like 40. They came up behind me and they beat me up. I was 14 and two 40-year-old men beat me up. What dickheads. Just saying. 
It was a difficult time and led Jackie to some extreme places. Something had happened at school. I think I got spat on. I just said to myself, right, fuck it, and left. And I walked out of school. I stole a packet of 16 paracetamol and took them in the toilet. Like, you know, obviously, I was feeling quite sick and ill. In the end, we went into hospital and checked in overnight. So, yeah, that was, that, that was hard. Jackie says she tried to kill herself half a dozen times before she was 14 years old. It was an anxious time for Susie. I thought I was going to lose her. I thought she was going to be dead. Yeah. I she, thought she would she kill herself. Would, yeah. It was so yeah. awful. Every day was a worry. I had nightmares about it, about her being subject to that sort of prejudice and, and hatred. So, yeah, I was terrified. So as is hopefully clear, the joy and laughter was not at the expense of Jackie. It's just at the happiness and the relief brought about the procedure. Again, Jackie was an adult by this point, working on the documentary alongside her mother. They've remained extremely close as far as I'm aware. So Farrow is trying to invent a problem where there is none. On what grounds? Well, her own child's comfort in discussing such issues. Thankfully, we're not all members of the Farrow household, a grim prospect, I must say. Different parents have different dynamics, and from Susie's work and compassion, I'm certain that had she said something that genuinely upset her daughter, she'd refrain from such. But no such thing has happened, so again, stop trying to shift the focus onto Susie. We're here to discuss your terrible behaviour. I think my overview about this is, I think the idea that to misgender somebody is a criminal offence worthy of police investigation, given all the resource issues that police have in this country, is ridiculous. So I'm very glad this has been dropped mm -hmm. on that respect. But I do, I, I agree with Susanna that the whole transgender debate is extremely fractious at the moment. Everyone on all sides gets very animated, right? And I don't think it helps the trans lobby when they get really aggressive uh, with people. I don't think it helps the people in your position, maybe Catholics who have a particular religiously based view about these things, to go the same way themselves. There has to be a coming together and a more respectful on both sides way of debating what are obvious issues that have arisen from this new open world of transgenderism. Okay. I know, and I accept that. And I'd also like to point out, my point of view is not simply Catholic. It's, it's a science and evidence right. base. Well, that's a blatant lie skewered by both the scientific and medical consensus. But thanks for inadvertently admitting that Catholicism is not evidence-based. There's nothing scientific about Caroline Farrow's perspective on trans people, rather the opposite. That's why she has to make libelous accusations instead of supplying period references on the subject. She engages not in simple insult, but ad hominem. That is, pure insult in place of argument. So how about you stop pretending that by invoking the name of science, you're accepting of it? But the thing is, the reason... Which you're entitled to have. But the thing well, I don't, is, I don't is... think what you are entitled to do, with respect to you, is to be quite so abusive no, it, no, on Twitter. Listen. So my question for you is, now that it's been dropped and you don't have to face the police action, do you feel a little bit regretful no. about the language you use no. and the way you phrased it? Absolutely not. And really? it's funny, yeah, and I spoke to... Um, you know, my husband's a very good judge of character on this, and he said, no, those tweets weren't spiteful and they really weren't meant to be. The point is here... Well, is your that, husband, no, sorry, listen, with respect, no, your, your husband, no, of course, is going to offer you but support. Listen, but no, no, some, he doesn't always, he doesn't always. But the, the point that I'm, I was trying to make here is that when we talk... Uh, the, the British public, I believe, are overwhelmingly good-natured and mm. tolerant, OK? And this is capitalised upon when we're talking about this issue in mm. children with, you know, dignity and compassion and respect. I agree. However, there is so much euphemism in this, in, in this area. We talk about gender affirmation surgery and bottom surgery. I want to be very clear what is being advocated for children. Castration is the removal of the testes. This happens in, in reassignment surgery. And black people eat bananas. But if you start harassing black people, waving bananas at them whilst making monkey noises and throwing about the N-word, people understand that context. This wasn't about you using said word in a medical context to inform people. This is about you using said word in a colloquial context, following it with claims of illegal activity and child abuse. The amount of bullshit you are spinning to try and avoid accountability through your vile actions is incredible. 
and again. I find myself congratulating Susanna Ree for being the voice of reason in pointing out the biased sampling of using your husband to support the idea that these tweets were not abusive. I mean, even total gammons like Piers Morgan think you went too far. When I started this video, I did not think I'd be finding myself agreeing with Piers Morgan on anything. But here you are, supplying us with the greater evil. The other thing that happens is that actually when it's done so early, um, it's recommended that this procedure needs to be repeated every 10 years, and it uses a section of the bowel, and eventually okay, somebody look. ends up needing Caroline, a new bowel. Caroline, this you is are, really yep. dangerous. Can we please just pause to revel in the idea that Pharaoh believes there are people walking around out there with no bowel because the evil transgenders came and stole it? Removing a section does not remove the whole, and many organs are fully capable of functioning with pieces missing. Also, organ donors do exist. All of this is a basic principle of plastic surgeries, which, by the way, were not developed for trans people. They were developed for accidents involving such things as fire, explosives, and acid. Take the guinea pig club, for example. They were a Sussex-based group of allied aircrew who had undergone plastic surgery after being injured during the Second World War during which the field took many leaps and bounds. And one major component of most plastic surgeries is taking skin or other organs from one place and grafting them elsewhere. So to try and paint this as a trans-only thing is not only ill-informed or actively dishonest, it's disgusting. Every insinuation here designed to demean trans people is an insult not only to them, but to every person who has undergone such procedures. Also, Knee-jerk repulsion is not a great argument. We see this everywhere from the old anti-gay, they stick their penises in each other's butts, to the vegan, it's like sucking it straight from a cow. The truth is we can make nearly anything sound disgusting. I could just walk you through the digestive process. That's not an argument against eating. Or hell, if you want to talk about euphemisms, how about the miracle of childbirth? There's a euphemism, and children, by the way, aren't a medical necessity. A trans person, meanwhile, getting the support they so urgently need, however, that is a medical necessity. But this is 16... How can a 16-year-old, you know, this, this child yes, had their Caroline, operation? Okay, do you know what? This is it's sounding incredibly personal. But and I think everybody agrees that you are entitled to your view. But I think, to, I think what, you know, people are concerned about is if you repeatedly target an individual but and I'm... call on other people to do the same and use language which is frankly insensitive, it's not going to... Whether it's legal or illegal, and we understand that, you know, we know the police have, have dropped the investigation, it is hurtful. But the thing and is, there's the no need for it. You are entitled to discuss the whole issue, but, but don't make it so personal. But the thing is, the truth is the truth. And on this issue, we need to tell the truth. It's not about hurtful. We need to say, we need to have a clear and honest and open discussion. This is what is being advocated by, right. you know, for children Caroline, under we 16. We, you know, it, it's, it's... Caroline, Caroline, the bottom line is, the debate we had on air between the pair of you was a lot more respectful than the one that then happened on Twitter. Mm. And I think that's my point, is that Twitter, sometimes people use it not thinking about the impact, whereas on television you may not have used some of the phrases that you used. And I just think there's a better way to have this debate mm. than simply hurling things like child abuse, castration or whatever at people on Twitter. There's a more respectful way but of how, doing it. How else, how else do I... You do it in a more respectful way. How do I way? convey the reality okay. of what is happening? Well, how do I look, convey that? Look, I don't think the police should be getting involved in this, but I certainly think the tone of the debate should be more respectful on both sides, mm. on both sides. We're going to leave it there. I'm just shocked that outside of the Trump-esque blame on both sides and his continued obliviousness towards the actual issue, Piers didn't say a whole lot. I, I don't know if it's because they didn't have a trans person on, but I've seen some of the shit he's done before and honestly, I expect her to be more angry at him by the end of this video. Do I think that trans people need to be perfectly polite towards their abusers, namely anyone who questions their right to exist? No, of course not. That's the form of political correctness which allowed the Nazis their comeback tour across Europe. Caroline Farrow is on the wrong side of history, not just in this instance, but in many. She has chosen to go out there and abuse others for no other reason than their existence and the existence of their children. Let's be truthful, Farrow doesn't care about the legality of the matter. 
she is just using that as an outlet for her prejudice against trans people. Though I'd like to offer Faro this piece of advice. If you're going to throw around accusations of child abuse, perhaps, just perhaps, you'd like to cancel your membership to the largest international child rape ring in history. The Catholic Church not only spends millions protecting known child rapists, it actively targets their victims with harassment in hopes that they will back down. You have chosen to actively participate in said organization to pay for said protective services for child rapists. Child rapists whom you yourself have rushed in to defend in spite of the evidence. Meanwhile, the National Lottery Fund, which had to carry out an extensive review of both Mermaids and its CEO following the Linham shitstorm, found there to be no evidence of abuse whatsoever. So not only are your accusations completely without merit, but you yourself actively support a genuine institution dedicated to protecting child abusers. So in the end, why did Farrow do all of this? Well, I think the why becomes clear with this tweet. Farrow has stated that quote, I remain prepared to go to prison over the right to state basic beliefs and truths. My family are all behind me, and though it would be awful for them, my daughter knows I would do it for her freedoms. End quote. Now, if this sounds somewhat familiar to you lot, that's possibly because it echoes something that Jordan Peterson stated surrounding the C-16 bill. He stated, quote, If they fine me, I won't pay it. If they put me in jail, I'll go on hunger strike. I'm not doing this, and that's that. I'm not using the words other people require me to use, especially if they're made up by radical left-wing ideologues. End quote. I am of the personal belief that Farrow's part in this was deliberate and she received the desired response. Either that, or she truly is just that foolish and simply stumbled into this before realising the attention it got her, setting about milking it for what it's worth. She's attempting to turn herself into the UK's answer to Jordan Peterson, based off the exact same lie. And the papers? They're all too happy to oblige. Now this is where my video originally ended, but upon verifying some statements made throughout today's pieces, I was approached by certain people who had some personal accounts about Caroline Farrow. There was a great deal of warning me about the consequences I would suffer for my piece on Farrow, and the great deal of concern about my future well-being. I was inundated with personal stories, each following the same cycle. Farrow attacks a trans person, often forcing them to deactivate their account. In response, trans folk would rally, and that rallying would be used by Farrow to paint herself as the victim. That's where Farrow's claims of abuse come from, something she then uses to gain money, which is probably why she seemed to shrink in that last segment as both presenters told her that no, her actions weren't acceptable. But what do you guys think? Should the papers which falsely reported this as Farrow being investigated for misgendering make clear that what they'd reported was an active lie? Do you think it would be fair for Farrow to face repercussions for active harassment and libel? Is there something inherently wrong with going to a country to receive life-saving procedures? Did I miss something you lot noticed? If so, be sure to leave us a comment down below. As always, I'll link a couple of our other videos at the end of this one. You can always support us on Patreon, we're trying to make the channel ad-free so be sure to check that out. I'd also like to say a big thank you to all our Patreon sponsors for making what we do possible, giving a special thanks to the following people. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, Brad R, McGay, John Schoenrock, Daniel Martinez, Ian Heinberg, Alexander Williams, and Atlas 5. Take care now, and I'll see you next time.